I think we will get started. Um, so thank you so much for coming and listening. Um, my name is Nicole Feigenblum and I'll be moderating tonight's event. I'm currently a third year medical student at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine and plan to pursue a career in obstetrics and gynecology. I'm also the secretary of the Joma Women's Health Committee. And I am just so thankful that you've all registered for our annual sexual health webinar. Tonight, we plan to address topics including female anatomy, the big O, sex during the reproductive cycle, and how to maintain the spark while trying to conceive. There will also be a question and answer at the end of the event, so please keep all the questions broad and not specific to you. All questions can be posted in the question and answer box. Please click the remain anonymous button prior to submitting your question. If you do not do so, we will be, be deleting the question just for your anonymity. Um, the, your presence on the webinar is completely anonymous and your video and voice are not enabled in, um, and attendees cannot be viewed. All right. Um, so first and foremost, we will have Dr. Lindsay Harper speak. Dr. Lindsay Harper is a board certified OBGYN and associate professor of OBGYN for Texas A&M um, College of Medicine and a fellow of the American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and a fellow of the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. Dr. Harper is the founder and CEO of Rosie, a women's health technology company that connects women who have sexual health concerns with hope, community, and research-backed solutions. She has been named Forbes top 53 women dis uh, disrupting healthcare, people, Na people newspaper 20 under 40, a top innovator in North Texas for 2020, and a DBJ top woman in tech. Um, without further ado, Dr. Lindsay Harper. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nicole. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to pin my video as instructed. Um, I am so glad to be here with y'all on this Sunday evening, and you'll hear lots of y'alls coming through because I'm in Texas, and so you can't hold it against me. That's just the way I talk. Um, but I am so passionate about women's sexual health, and I especially love opportunities like this um, where we can really you know, connect and get answers to all the questions that we have, but we really aren't sure where to find, you know, the, the evidence-based resources for. And so that is really what this is all about tonight. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity um, to share some of our, our passion, clearly lots of people involved in this with you. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to share my screen so y'all can see everything that uh, we have going on. And hopefully you can see my slides. I think so. Great. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. I'll tell you a little bit about my journey to where I am today. As an OBGYN, I had a ton of patients who had sexual health difficulties and would ask me these questions all the time. But even as an OBGYN, a women's health expert, I had no idea how to help these women with their problems, right? I had not had any training in low sexual desire. I'd had some in sexual pain, but not, not a lot. I had had very little in trouble with orgasm, none in trouble with arousal, some in trouble with lubrication. But the questions that I was getting every day from my patients just left me kind of, um, you know, helpless in terms of what to offer them. And I became really obsessed with this space because there's so many opportunities for men to have these conversations to get the, you know, the help that they need. But but for lots of reasons, women have been left behind. And so I joined ISWISH, which is a medical society. They're actually multidisciplinary um, and they do a lot of evidence-based research and training for women's sexual health. Decided that I wanted to start a company dedicated to that. Um, that's what Rosie is. We can talk a little bit about that, but this is my passion now is really just educating women and actually physicians as well um, about women's sexual health. So thanks for the opportunity. All right, let's see if we can get this going. Here we go. Okay, so first we're gonna start with an anatomy lesson. And actually just briefly, I'm going to stop sharing because I want y'all to see my vulva puppet. And I don't know if anyone's ever brought y'all a vulva puppet before, but if not, you've been missing out. This is, we call her Violet. She's very soft, if you could feel her. Um, and what is so important about this is that even as doctors, so many of us call the external female genitalia the vagina. 
but that's completely incorrect. The, anything you can see on the outside is called the vulva. And we don't do men the disrespect of calling their body parts by the wrong names, and neither should we do that for ourselves, right? We should call our own body parts the right names. We should expect that of our medical professionals. We should expect that to teach that to our children. So this is called a vulva. And from this day forward, I hope that you always call it this. And so we're going to talk about the different parts of the vulva because an anatomy lesson was promised. So these are the labia majora. They have hair on them, um, and they're meant to protect the more sensitive parts here. These are the labia minora. They can be really small and tucked in. They can be long. They can be uneven. They can be all sorts of things. They do not have hair, um, and they're there to sort of protect the opening in the vagina. But additionally, what they also have, let me just show you this really quickly. This is called the clitoral hood, and it's actually like the foreskin of the penis, okay? And so what happens similarly to when men experience an erection, um, the, the uh, clitoral hood retracts back when women become aroused to reveal the clitoris, which is this very sensitive part right here at the top of the labia minora. In fact, too, the, the clitoris extends down into the labia. So this, can, this is good to know because you can experience um, sexual pleasure with the um, stimulation of the clitoris, both here at the clitoral head, but also down into the labia as well. Just below that is the urethra. Back in here is the vagina. I'm seeing some comments that y'all aren't, is, is, are we having some technical problems? We're doing okay? Okay, great, I'll keep going. Um, okay, and so down in here, the part that opens, right, where if you have a gynecologic exam, the speculum goes in, this is where babies come out. If you use tampons, this is where tampons go in. This is actually the vagina, the vaginal canal in here, right? So externally is the vulva, internally is called the vagina. And sexual pleasure is experienced for most women with clitoral stimulation. And in fact, 85% of women need clitoral stimulation in order to have an orgasm. So I see lots of patients who are worried that they cannot have an orgasm from penetrative sex or penis and vagina sex, right? And they're trying and trying, they think something's wrong with them, their partner might think something's wrong with them, but in fact, what they need is clitoral stimulation and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So that's really, really important to know because a lot of people seek medical attention for that and in fact, it's totally normal. It's just portrayed incorrectly in most books and movies and just really everything we learn about sexuality. So something really, really important to know. Okay, so now we had our anatomy lesson. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my slides with y'all. Great. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about um, briefly the most common sexual complaints for women because there's a lot of them. And I think even as a physician, I didn't really understand how common some of these things were. So when we break this down in terms of category, sexual desire is the most common sexual complaint that women experience, reported by almost 39% of women. Um, and this is a really important qualifier that that plus distress, meaning there's a, a lot of worry about it, there's um, trouble in the relationship about it, the, the woman herself feels shame about it, that is about 10% of the population. And in my experience, this is the numbers are higher, but I'm just reporting the data. Um, I don't know how many of y'all agree on the panel, but um, there's also um, the second most common is trouble with arousal. That's reported by about a quarter of women. And arousal, it's actually really important for y'all to know, desire happens in the brain, right? So desire is the thought like, oh, I, you know, I feel like being intimate. I want to have sex. Arousal is in the body, in the genitals, in the vulva, right? When, when the clitoris and the labia become engorged, just like a man's penis becomes erect, our um, clitoris and labia become engorged as well. So that's arousal. Arousal happens in the genitals, desire happens in the brain, just to clarify that. So about a quarter of women have trouble with arousal. 5.4% of women report trouble with that plus distress. So they're worried and they're bothered by that. Um, they're about uh, one fifth of women experience trouble with orgasm and about 5% of women also are reporting distress because of that issue. So this chart you'll notice there's a huge complaint missing right they didn't they didn't evaluate for that in the study which is sexual pain. And the data around sexual pain is that 75% of women will experience sexual pain at some point in their lives so that's most of us right and that's not surprising because there's so many times when we could experience sexual pain it could be 
when we first start having sexual intercourse. It could be as a result of a medical problem or a chronic condition. It could be as a result of childbirth. It could be as a result of menopause. There's lots and lots of reasons we might have sexual pain. Um, that's not on this chart, but it's a very, very common problem. So when we bring all of these numbers together, the, just the ones on the chart, 44% of women, so almost half of women are suffering with a sexual problem, and 12% of women are ex experiencing a problem with distress. And once again, leaving out pain, which is a huge, huge issue, which deserves a whole webinar probably in and of itself. Um, so that's, I think, really illuminating because you would think that, you know, as a medical um, group, as women's health experts, if half of our patients were suffering with an issue, we would know something about it, right? Or if half of women in the world were suffering with a problem, the world might be talking about it a little more or helping women a little bit more. So I think that exactly this webinar tonight is doing, is doing that and such a powerful opportunity um, for everybody here. Okay, so the impact that this low sexual desire can have on the quality of life, I think is really important. A lot of women are worried about their partner's fidelity. They have they report lower self-confidence. They report less connectedness with their partner. And 69% of women report a worse in body image. So um, I think it's really important for us to know how these sexual problems can affect us in other ways than just actually the act of sex itself. And when we talk about this idea of low libido, which affects 38, 39% of women, there's also a subcategory or something called HSDD or hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So this is actually the 10% of women that are experiencing distress due to their low sexual desire. And that actually is a diagnostic criteria. So you can be diagnosed with this by your physician and there are um, pharmaceutical interventions. So medications that you can take if you think you might be suffering from hypoactive active sexual desire disorder. So we're going to look at a couple of things about how to diagnose that. So everyone's like, oh, I definitely think I have HSDD. That's a really common, you know, response when I present that slide. But it's important to know that these symptoms must be present for at least six months, right? So it's not due to like, oh, you had, you know, a child a month ago. Well, that's a very common time of life, right? To not be feeling desirous of sex. Or if there's a major stressor, a death in the family, an economic, you know, situation, something like that. So it's for at least six months. And the patient or the woman reports lack of motivation um, as manifested by either reduced or absent spontaneous desire or responsive desire. And we'll come to that a little bit later in my talk, um, which is a super interesting idea. So no desire at all. And this means that not only do you not want to initiate sex, but even when sex is initiated, you're also not interested. Um, and then also this number two is loss of desire to initiate or participate in sexual activity, including behavioral responses such as avoidance. And these are really common and um, often, you know, um, ignored, which is that your partner may come and try to show you signs of affection, like a back rub, or maybe they will kiss you on the cheek, or maybe they'll want to hold your hand, and you'll automatically kind of recoil because you think in your mind that that might lead to sex, right? And so because you know you don't want to have sex, you're going to back up 10 steps and also not want to hold hands, also not want to kiss, also not want to have any you know, physical affection or attention because where it might lead down the road. And over time, that can really build up you know, a big barrier within a relationship in terms of intimacy, not just sexual intimacy, but overall intimacy as well. So it's something really um, <clears throat> to be aware of. And then also, once again, it's this identifier of personal distress, including frustration, grief, incompetence, loss, sadness, or worry. So I think it's really important when we talk about sexual problems that we really think uh, and talk a lot about this distress factor. Because we, so for example, if there are two people involved in a relationship and they're you know they are one or both are experiencing what we would say low sexual desire but they're not bothered by it then that's okay that's a totally that's a totally you know fine way to be we're not trying to say oh if you can't have an orgasm you have a you know you have a problem it's if you're distressed or if you're bothered by the fact that you can't have an orgasm or if you're distressed if you're bothered by the fact that you have low sexual desire that's when we would want to help with an intervention if you were if you were seeking help for that so I hope that makes sense. 
Okay, one really important thing to know is that there are lots of medications that can cause sexual dysfunction, especially low desire, trouble with arousal, and trouble with orgasm. And most of those medications that are most common are the depression medications. Um, and so it's really important that we know that depression and sexual dysfunction sometimes go together, and that's totally fine. It's just something to be aware of. But it's also important to know that People who are depressed, who are not treated for their depression, have worse sexual function than people who are depressed and who are on medication. So I don't want you to come away from this talk and if you're on a depression medication, which a lot of people are, depression or anxiety, and say, oh, this doctor said I need to stop all my meds. That's absolutely positively not what I'm saying, because I'm saying if your medication is treating your depression, you actually probably have better sexual function than if you were just depressed. But what's really important to know and powerful for um, women to know, for our doctors to know, is that there are medications that can that are more likely to cause sexual side effects and more medications that are less likely to cause sexual side effects right so if you started a medication for depression or anxiety and you noticed a, a sexual side effect your doctor can say that that is a failed treatment because a sexual side effect is a failed treatment and they can move you to one in the class that's a little bit better for sexual function um, so that's definitely something that i would encourage for you to bring up with whomever is your prescriber because you don't just have to live with that and you know what men are men are counseled when they're started on medications that mess with their sexual function like beta blockers and you know um, antidepressants but unfortunately women are not counseled as often so that's something really that we want to advocate for um, and that i would love for you you know if that's something you're experiencing to speak up to your provider about. Histamine blockers, so allergy medicines can cause vaginal dryness. Beta blockers can cause trouble with arousal, just like they can cause erectile dysfunction in men. And then, you know, a lot of women are taking hormonal medications like oral contraceptives. So they have a wide range of effect on sexual desire. Um, three and a half percent report decreased desire, 12 percent report an increase in desire, and the majority, 85 percent report no change. So, you know, if you've experienced a change in sexual function due to a medication, it's 100 percent worth a conversation with your provider. And if you don't feel like that's being taken seriously, then you definitely need to find someone who will listen a little bit more closely. Okay, so this is a, um, hearkening back to what we were discussing a few minutes ago, which is the sexual response cycle. So this is from back in the 60s, Masters and Johnson, who were the, you know, the first major sex researchers in the United States, were studying what we call the sexual response cycle. And they noticed when they had people come into the lab, they observed them having sex, they noticed first arousal, plateau, orgasm or two or three and then resolution and then about 10 years later they stuck desire on the front of this because just like when you're hungry you know hunger comes before eating most of the time so they just kind of put it on the front and they decided that that was good enough but then a few years later in 2001 um, Rosemary Basson, who's a sex researcher who was working mainly with women, said, you know what, this is not a lot of the way that my um, clients are experiencing the sexual response cycle, and, and really postulated this circular um, re sexual response cycle, which makes a lot more sense to many women, which is to say some women have a spontaneous sex drive, and some women sometimes have spontaneous sex drive, but there's also this other pathway where you might be exposed to a sexual stimuli and then experience arousal, which we remember happens in the genitals, right? When we experience engorgement in the clitoris and in the labia, that arousal can then um, then cause the brain to trigger desire, right? So you might have a physical response first that then is expressed in your brain as desire. That might lead to a sexual experience that then increases emotional and physical satisfaction and feeds back into this really positive loop of sexual response. So what this is showing is that sometimes arousal comes before desire, and that's completely fine and normal. And if we are, you know, trying to improve desire in our lives, we can use this um, concept to our advantage. Okay, so what can you do next, right? So there, I have a few slides that talk have some evidence-based resources, and this is the honestly the best place to start is to educate yourself with evidence-based resources. If you're experiencing low desire, there is some good data for L-arginine, which is a supplement that can, and the best studies have been done in this supplement called Argin Max. It takes about eight weeks to see if it's going to work or not, so that could be something kind of easy supplement you could add. But it is contraindicated, meaning women who have herpes, some 
complex with really frequent outbreaks should not take it. So if you have an HSV or herpes, this isn't a good choice, but otherwise it's relatively safe. Um, some self-help options, there's some books, there's Rosie, which is the platform that I started. I can, I'm gonna go over that briefly. Coaching and a great website called OMG Yes. There's sex therapy, which I'm sure we'll hear about here in just a minute, but here's a great website to find a sex therapist. Then there are some medications, including prescriptions. There's some, a couple that are FDA approved. I just added in testosterone here because we get questions about that a lot, but that is not FDA approved. Um, so deserves a really um, you know, um, lengthy conversation with your prescriber um, if, that's the, if that's the route you wanna go. All right, so here's some amazing books that I love. This, okay, so Lori Mintz is one of my favorite people. Um, she's a sex therapist and she's a PhD in Florida. And she wrote A Tired Woman's Guide to Passionate Sex and also Becoming Clitorate, which talks a lot about female pleasure and the clitoris in general. And then Emily Nagoski wrote Come As You Are. These are just wonderful evidence-based books that can really improve um, sexual health. So I would, I would recommend these to anybody. OMG Yes is a website all about sexual pleasure. So about how women experience sexual pleasure. It can be for you, it can be for your partner. It's extremely educational. Um, and then also, as we mentioned, I started an app called Rosie. It's free to download. Um, and there are different options, including a library of erotica, which really can kick off that arousal desire pathway that we spoke of. Um, and we have specific classes for things that are unique to women um, and, and really personalized, highly personalized. So for example, we recorded a whole class for Orthodox Jewish women um, with Dr. Batsheva Marcus. Um, we have uh, resources for sexual trauma, we have resources for sexual pain. So if you are looking for a personalized sort of digital opportunity, then that might be a good one for you. And I think I finished on time. I hope so. I have a lot to say, um, but I'd love to stay in touch with anyone who's interested. Um, this is, like, as I said, my passion. I'm so thankful for the opportunity. So I think we're taking questions at the end, but I look forward to connecting. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Harper. Um, just give me one second. Uh, I'm just trying to unpin you so you can be relieved. There we go. All right, um, first of all, thank you so much. That was incredibly informative. We already have some um, questions coming in the question and answer box. Again, please be sure that when you are asking questions, please click the remain anonymous so that um, we can provide anonymity to all of our attendees. Um, so now moving on from Dr. Harper, we have the incredible Carly Khadash. I hopefully pronounced that correctly. Um, she, Carly Khadash is an MSS LSW, so a licensed social worker um, and therapist who lives in the Lower Marion suburb of Philadelphia, where she also serves as the director of the Lower Marion Community Mikva. Carly has advanced training in sexual dysfunction as well as perinatal mental health and works to provide holistic support to individuals and couples she treats. In addition to her work with the Jewish Family Children's Service of Greater Philadelphia, Carly maintains a private sex therapy practice treating clients in person and via telehealth. Carly is actively working towards her AASECT. I'm not sure what that stands for, but um, it's a certification. Um, and we are just so excited to have you. And um, the floor is yours, Carly. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I feel so um, I feel so grateful to be following such a comprehensive educational uh, program from Dr. Harper. Thank you so much. Um, it really resonated for me when you said how much your medical training lacked in sexual dysfunction education. And I'm so grateful that there are doctors like you that are out there working with women and impacting women's health directly. Um, I cannot wait to check out Rosie and hear more about it from you offline. Um, and I'm really, um, I'm just really glad that we're all here. So I am going to share my screen. Okay. All right. So, um, and I'm not sure if I'm pinned. Let me pin myself. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to start off with an introduction of what is sex therapy, because I think a lot of people hear the idea of going to sex therapy and they're like, oh my gosh, that is something that sounds super intense. And what if I feel really uncomfortable talking about sex? And so the way that I like to explain sex therapy is that it's actually really similar to regular therapy, um, just that we're going to be looking at all of the issues that you're bringing into the therapeutic space from kind of a sexual lens. So when we're talking about, you know, what kind of messages did you get about sex when you were growing up? What kinds of affection, if any, did you see between your parents, between um, other married adults in your life or other adults in your life? Um, what kind of stigmas do you have around sex and sexual pleasure? When did you learn about sex and what was that experience like for you? Um, and then I'm going to talk a lot about this throughout my presentation, but one of the biggest interventions that we use in sex therapy is that we want to redefine sex, redefine foreplay, and redefine the goal of sex to really focus on pleasure instead of focusing on orgasm, which brings me to my next slide. So um, Dr. Harper gave a phenomenal um, overview of how most women experience orgasm. And I'm just gonna reiterate that 85% of women do not experience orgasm from vaginal penetration alone. And that the majority of women really need clitoral stimulation in order to achieve orgasm. And I totally agree that this is a major theme that I see in my practice, where a lot of women think that if they're not experiencing sexual pleasure or orgasm from penetration, that there must be something wrong with them. And I would, all, I would also say the most common question that I get asked in my practice is, am I normal? Is what I am experiencing normal? And I say to every single one of my clients, like there is no normal. Everybody has a different experience. Every body is different. Every relationship is different. And we're going to work on defining the normal for you in your relationship that feels good. 18% of women can experience an orgasm from penetration alone. And then I found this, which I think therapeutically is a really enticing statistic that 59% of women report faking an orgasm at least once in their lives. So the therapist in me sees a, 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 a stat like that. And I'm like, well, we have to have some pretty difficult conversations coming into the therapy space, which is where we talk about communication. So I loved how um, Dr. Harper explained the, um, the responsive desire cycle as the arousal um, and um, the arousal and desire cycle. The way that we describe it in therapy is more like spontaneous desire versus responsive desire. So spontaneous desire is defined as like what we see in media and the movies or in books where you, you see something that looks good. And you're like, I want that, I'm attracted to that, and therefore I want to have sex. And it's kind of the way, you know, there is no gender divide with this. And I always talk about how um, people have a lot of misconceptions where they think that men have spontaneous desire, and women have a responsive desire, but really it could go both ways. And I've seen both in my practice. Um, but spontaneous desire is like you see a sexual stimulus, you're attracted, you feel aroused, you feel desire, and you want to go for it. Responsive desire is, and I also really like to use um, analogies with food when we're talking about sex. So I, I say, like, imagine that you're walking down the boardwalk on a hot day and you're not really hungry, but, you know, the idea of like an ice cream sounds really good. But you're like, I wouldn't really go out of my way to get an ice cream. But then you see somebody walking with like a gorgeous ice cream cone with like a giant scoop and then maybe another scoop and some toppings and some sprinkles. And you're like, you know what? I think I really do want an ice cream cone. And then you'll like go out of your way to do whatever you have to do to get that ice cream cone. That's responsive desire. It's having some context around intimacy and around sexuality to be able to be perceptive and receptive to that desire and arousal process. Um, so how do we create that in our relationships? That is probably the biggest question that I have. And when people say that they want to create context in their relationships, they usually think that means that like their husband has to do more around the house. And that's the advice that most husbands are getting, right? They're like, they're getting the advice from their teachers, they're getting it from their friends. Like if you just do the dishes more, or if you take care of the kids more then like she'll be open to sex more. And I always say like, that's not true because 
really, you know, like they live in the house too, and it's their responsibilities too. But really the work actually falls on you if you're the type of person who experiences more responsive desire. That when you see your spouse doing something that you find attractive, you need to frame it for yourself in a sexual way. So if you see your spouse had like a killer meeting at work and is going to get an awesome bonus, if you think to yourself, oh my gosh, we can finally go on that vacation that we want. And like, that's where it ends. That's not going to translate into sexuality. But if you see your husband had a killer meeting at work and is going to get an awesome bonus and you're like, wow, that is so sexy. He works so hard. I'm so happy to be married to somebody like that it's going to be a lot easier for it to translate into the bedroom. And the same goes for if you see him doing the dishes, if you see him learning and studying Torah and you say like, I find that really attractive and I'm so grateful to be married and in a relationship with somebody like that, then the space between arousal and desire is a lot smaller and it's a lot easier to get to. Something else that can be uncomfortable in the beginning for a lot of couples is using creativity. So again, going back to that food analogy, because I think it's just so accessible. One of my favorite activities to do with clients is to create a sexual menu of activities that can be like go-to dishes, things that feel like safe and comfortable all of the time. And then maybe something that's a little bit out of the ordinary and special that they might want to do every once in a while, you know, like a seasonal dish. And you want to talk about this in terms of like appetizers and entrees and dessert. And this can help encourage conversation around sexuality and can also help increase pleasure. And then I want to also talk about the definition of intimacy. We want to talk about the definition of intimacy is being able to say, I want to pull out that menu and I want to have a three course meal or to be able to say, you know what, I don't think I have the energy for a three course meal, but I could really go for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without your partner feeling like there's any sort of stigma or judgment against them and to recognize that you can meet each other where you are. So the sexual um, experience changes throughout the life cycle. And some of the largest changes that women experience are with pregnancy and postpartum. So during pregnancy, hormonal shifts cause changes in libido. Um, and a lot of women report having lower desire in the first and third trimesters with an increase in desire, along with an increase in energy in the second trimester. Some women say, and this is really anecdotally, um, unfortunately, there is not a lot of research around pregnancy and arousal and intimacy. It's on my to-do list, but you'll have to check back with me probably in about 10 years to see how much progress I get to make in that. Um, but some women report anecdotally that if they were not able to experience an orgasm from penetrative sex before pregnancy, that sometimes the increase in blood flow into the vagina during pregnancy can actually make an orgasm with penetration easier and can increase the intensity of orgasm as well with clitoral orgasms. There are so many myths that exist around um, having sex when pregnant, and it's really important to know that the baby is not going to be hurt from sex, um, and that unless you have a risk and your doctors put you on pelvic rest, that um, sex and orgasm will not bring on labor prematurely in a healthy pregnancy. Um, but that being said, if your doctor does put you on pelvic rest, you should ask really explicit and specific questions about what activities are permitted um, during sex in order to be able to maintain that intimacy. So um, I want to point out this image that I chose. Um, it's from a phenomenal book um, from an organization that's actually local to me in Philadelphia called the Postpartum Stress Center. Um, and it's a book called What About Us by a clinician named Karen Kleiman. And you see a woman here who's clearly postpartum. She's wearing a postpartum diaper. It looks like she's breastfeeding and she's experienced some milk leakage. And she turns to her, her husband and she says, sexy, huh? And he says, you look great. You just had a baby. I think you're amazing. And she says, I'm exhausted. I'm crying for no reason. I'm hanging out and I'm squishy all over. I'm bleeding. My vagina is swollen. I'm peeing myself and I'm afraid to poop because my hemorrhoids are so bad. I'm wearing a freaking diaper. I know an amazing human being came out of my body and that's awesome, but my body doesn't feel like it belongs to me anymore. I feel like a stranger to myself. And this experience is so common for women who are postpartum. There are so many hormone changes that can impact sexual response as well as sexual desire. 
Um, this includes body image changes, identity shifts, and growing responsibilities. All of a sudden, you have to negotiate a baby when it comes to having a sexual relationship. And hormone changes from breastfeeding can also lower uh, the sexual hormones and increase um, increased sexual dysfunction. Um, this can definitely be, by, be exacerbated when there's the presence of a perinatal mood disorder, which should be evaluated by a qualified mental health professional. Most of the research really criticizes the emphasis of the six week postpartum checkup as being like the starting line to resume regular sexual activity, um, which is sooner than most women report feeling ready. And 83% of women are still reporting pelvic pain with penetration at three months post-delivery, with 30% of women reporting pelvic pain at six months postpartum. And the image that I chose here is kind of the opposite of that desire and arousal cycle that Dr. Harper shared with us before. This is the sexual pain um, and the pain and anxiety response cycle, because what happens with a lot of people is that when they experience an injury, AKA childbirth, episiotomy, or pain with sex, um, and then have a painful experience, then mentally what could end up happening is that they catastrophize not just the injury, but that experience. And then that catastrophizing will lead to the, the, the fear of pain and the perceived threat of, in this case, sex, and then you might engage in avoidance activities to avoid having sexual experiences. This is where help from a qualified medical professional, um, like a pelvic floor PT, an OBGYN, and a sex therapist can be really helpful because what we can do is we can help reframe that painful experience and the injury, and then also help promote healing through exercises with something like pelvic floor PT. I do want to really emphasize that the research is so hopeful and indicates that at around six months postpartum, sexual pleasure increases to back to wherever baseline was prior to childbirth. Um, and really, again, reiterate the necessity of pelvic floor PT. What happens when there's an infertility diagnosis? So um, I just pulled some quotes from an online forum um, called I Had a Miscarriage um, where, that I thought were really striking uh, about the purpose that sex had when someone was trying to, um, was trying to conceive and was experienced fertility treatment. Um, I was also just talking with a friend right before this, uh, this program this evening and I was saying, I wasn't sure if I was gonna disclose this, but I think I feel comfortable disclosing that I also experienced about four years of fertility treatment before I had my first child. And my experience in understanding the role that sex played in my own marriage um, was definitely a huge part in the reason that I got into the, um, the career path that I got into. The most important piece on this slide, and which is why I made it the largest font here, is the idea that pleasure and grief must coexist and that it's okay to be grieving the process. It's okay to be grieving what you thought your process to get to parenthood was going to look like. And it's okay to experience pleasure at the same time of, as that. And one is not going to take away from the other. Now, when I asked my friend um, what advice really struck her during this, she said that she thinks it would be most important for husbands to be spoken to about the way that their wives may experience sex differently during infertility. And also really emphasizing that intimacy doesn't only happen in the bedroom, it can happen outside of the bedroom as well. And while sex might only, dis only seem to have the function of conception when you're hyper-focused on having a successful pregnancy or when you're grieving multiple losses, that focusing on ways to kind of take the pressure off and lessen expectations around sex, take the focus off of orgasm, take the focus off of penetrative sex, other than when it's medically necessary in order to help you achieve that goal, can help you maintain strength and friendship in your marriage and help you get through to the next stop on your journey. So this is my last slide, and I really just wanted to end by talking about the importance of collaborative care when faced with a sexual health diagnosis, meaning that when you are faced with a sexual challenge, the best practice is to get medical care 
rule out underlying issues like heart conditions and diabetes that can coexist with sexual dysfunction. Meet with a mental health provi provider, whether it's a sex therapist or a qualified sex therapist, to learn coping skills, framework for communication and relational skills, and then a pelvic floor specialist, um, which is a, a physical therapist, which can help you increase pelvic floor function and therefore get access to orgasm, intimacy, and pleasure in a way um, that's much more hands-on and, and intimate um, in an intimate way um, than medical care, or mental health care, but all of them are necessary in order to help promote um, sexual health and pleasure. All right. Well, I feel like I was, I was just given an incredible amount of information and we see how many people have logged on to our event, how many questions have been asked. And there are just a few questions that we think would be um, a really great options to ask you live. Um, and we will, I'll ask either of you to really answer, please just give any information that you may have, if you don't have anything to add, that is okay. And we will move on to the next question. All right, um, as this is going on, please feel free to ask, continue asking questions in the question and answer box. And if we find that it's um, a good one to ask live, we will do so. All right, so the first one is um, how to deal with um, being in a relationship where the two of you don't have um, the same sex drive. How do you go about it? And what can you do? Um, maybe if we start with Carly and then if Dr. Harper has anything. Um, absolutely. So it is incredibly common for two people in a relationship to have differing sex drives and to have two differing responses to sexual stimuli. And the most, um, the biggest advice that I could give you is to really communicate about it. Communicate about your needs, have your spouse communicate about their needs, talk about what feels good for you, what feels good for them, and then how to help each other um, create that context so that way you can have a positive sexual experience together. But it is incredibly, I would say it's even rare to have two individuals that are um, that are in a relationship that have the same sex drive, especially because we know that sex drive changes so drastically during times of stress or uh, times of life transition. So the only thing I would add to that, and I definitely agree with Carly is that um, because there are people, couples who have different sex drives, it doesn't mean that one is bad and the other is good or one is right and the other is wrong. It's just different. It's like maybe you you and your partner like to exercise differently. Like you just have, you know, it's just a difference. And so once again, communication is the key, but it doesn't mean that somebody has a pathology and the other person is the normal one, right? It's just once again, something to negotiate just like you might negotiate how you handle your finances or how you parent your children, you know, just something to be open and communicate about 100%. Yeah, I think, I think communication is definitely key. And that was um, a big aspect to both of your presentations today. So it's definitely a great takeaway. Um, the next question is with regards to consummating a marriage or for people that um, have never had sexual intercourse or virgins currently, how um, do you have any strategies or just any comments about how to go about that um, other than, I mean, I'm sure communication is a part of it, but maybe if we can start with um, Lindsay, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so much to this, right? Because we, because we don't talk about sex generally in our society, we all come away with it feeling like there's something bad and dirty and shameful about it. And then when we are in a context, for example, marriage where sex is permissible slash encouraged slash mandatory sometimes for childbirth or childbearing reasons, we have to flip the switch in our brain, right? Sex is bad, dirty, stay away to I'm a sexual, you know, goddess and everything's fabulous, right? So that's a big transition to make. And it happens truly one step at a time with that open communication like we talked about. But I think another key piece of it that makes people uncomfortable sometimes and um, but I think is necessary 
and if you frame it in the right way, we talk a lot about, you know, understanding your own sexual pleasure so that then you can bring it to the relationship, feeling confident and able to communicate about it, right? It's if you were to try to figure out something about your partner, you would want as much coaching or as much instruction from them. And the same can be true for the way that we experience sex and sexual pleasure. So, you know, if someone's comfortable with self-pleasure, masturbation, whatever, however we want to talk about it, that's great because it can give you really good context about how does your body function? How does it feel when you do one thing versus another thing? If you're not comfortable with that idea, then you can frame it in the way that like, okay, this is practice for being with my partner, my husband, you know, and it doesn't have to be, oh, I'm, you know, pleasuring myself for sake of pleasure, although I would totally 100% approve of that. But it could be that, okay, I'm practicing so that I can communicate this with my partner and we can have, you know, the fulfilling sex life that we both desire. So I think that that's actually a really big key component of it that oftentimes gets left out. I think that um, that's definitely really um, important. And I think that it's difficult to talk about that in our society as Orthodox Jews, where something like masturbation is considered so taboo. Um, but I totally agree that knowing what feels good in your body, even if you're not even if you're not masturbating, knowing what kind of touch feels good and feels safe and can be kind of viewed as like a bridge to that sexual activity with your partner, I think that that can be a really good place to start. A really powerful tool that we have is, is verbalization. So, um, you know, that going back to that example that I gave about walking down the boardwalk and seeing that really delicious ice cream cone there's actually a really simple intervention that anybody can use to make that ice cream cone taste better, which is to actually just say out loud, like, wow, this ice cream is delicious. So just by saying it out loud, you're actually making the ice cream taste better to your brain. Um, and so I think that's a really important tool to not just be able to verbalize like where you feel uncomfortable, but also be able to verbalize what feels good and to verbalize where you do feel comfortable. And then the other piece of advice that I would give you, um, and this wasn't in my bio, but I am a college teacher. So I do have um, a little bit of an understanding of the Jewish law around um, consummation and what the expectations are for being newly married is that it's okay if it doesn't happen right away. And that it's okay if you need to take some extra time and working with a, a halachic authority or a kala teacher or a chassan teacher who can help guide you through the process and the transition to becoming sexually active without putting pressure on yourself is a really important thing and needs to be said, I think, in a forum like this. Yeah, um, well, thank you. And I think a question that has come in recently um, within the past couple of minutes is how do I know I'm having an orgasm? Um, and that kind of goes along with this. So if you can um, either of you really just speak to that. Um, we can start with Dr. Her. Okay, sounds good. You know, this is actually a really common question. So if you are wondering this, I want you to know that you're not alone, you're not broken, you're not weird, that you're not the only person to ask this, because I think Carly's nodding too, that we both get asked this question a lot. And, you know, without coming to a lab and us like measuring the delta in your like pelvic floor contractions, we're not gonna be able to say, yes, you've had an orgasm or no, you haven't. And it's really more about listening to kind of the description of orgasms, you know, from other people. So what happens physiologically when we have an orgasm is that, um, you know, the, the tension in the muscles of the pelvic floor kind of builds up and then it really, it um, uh, results in a spasmodic contraction. So the pelvic floor contracts, releases, contracts, releases, contracts, releases. And sometimes that happens lots of times. Some One time, sometime you can build up again and have another contraction release. And then usually after an orgasm, you know, there can be lots of emotions that are experienced, to be honest. There can, most of the time, it's sort of a calm, peaceful, kind of euphoric feeling. But other times, because of the release of hormones, people might be more tearful or, you know, some women have other physiologic reactions um, including headaches or, you know, there's all kinds of things that can have to happen with and after orgasm. So the, the answer is, is that it's completely, you know, dependent on the person. It's actually completely dependent on the context. It's completely dependent on the day. You know, at one orgasm is not usually anything like another. Um, and it's really just is like, it comes from experience. But I'd love Carly to hear what you have to say about that, because it's kind of a difficult question to answer. 
Yeah, I think that you gave a really great overview. Um, the only thing that I would add is that if the research shows that if we focus on orgasm as the goal, we actually make orgasms less attainable for women in sex. And if we instead take the focus off of orgasm and make it again about pleasure and what feels good, then um, it's actually more likely that someone's going to experience an orgasm. Um, and this is something that's really powerful. I see it especially with my clients that are on antidepressants and SSRIs, because one of, like you said, one of the unfortunate side effects is that orgasm becomes something that's really unattainable. And sometimes when they can really be mindful and in the moment and not focused on orgasm at all, like completely take it off the table, then they'll come to a session and be like, well, I had an orgasm. What a lovely surprise. And we do a little happy dance and, and then talk about, you know, whether it's reasonable to say we're going to try to recreate that as a goal. And usually the answer is no, we want to just focus on pleasure and not focus on orgasm as a goal. Wow, well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, um, we just kind of on the opposite end, what if, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the question so I word it properly. Um, what if I don't like feel the feeling of an orgasm that it's too strong? Are there any thoughts, comments, tips for that? Uh, we can start with Carly and then move on. Oh, Dr. Herb. Me first. Okay. Um, so this is also really common where sometimes, especially um, if you're the type of person who likes to be in control all of the time, um, that feeling of having an orgasm can sometimes make you feel like you're out of control. Like Dr. Harper said, it comes with an intense um, hormonal shift and you might feel teary eyed or get a headache. And that intensity can be a lot for some people. Um, and there are great, you know, um, psycho psychological interventions that we can do around exposures and feeling more comfortable with the feeling of having an orgasm. Um, but, you know, I would say that if you're having an aversion to an orgasm, that it is something that's a good idea to check out with a mental health professional. All right, you're good. All right, so we can move on. Um, I think this is a, a question that we commonly get. Um, what if I'm just plain exhausted all the time, working, full-time job, parent, all those things. What, um, any tips for that? Uh, we can start with Dr. Harper. Yeah, this is actually like maybe the number one question. I know we keep saying that, but I just want you all to know you're asking very common questions. So you're not in the minority of women. You're in the majority by far. Um, yeah, this is just, this is tough because whenever, you know, I have three children, I obviously work, my husband works, like we're very, very busy. And I think the, the task for us in order to really make emotion or make uh, intimacy a priority is to step back and to say, what do we want our life like to look like when we're however old, 80, let's say 80. And for me, it's, you know, I want to have a great relationship with my partner, my husband. I want to have a great relationship with my family. I want to feel like I've done something that made a difference in the world. And so then we have to divide up our time according to those goals, right? And I think oftentimes our relationship with our partner really gets kind of put on the back burner because we're so busy doing this stuff that sucks up our time, that demands our time. And our partner might not be that demanding of our time. But if we take a look at those big picture goals for our life and our partner is there and that emotional intimacy with that partner, not just like roommates, but like, you know, truly people who enjoy being around one another and we decide that intimacy is part of that, then we have to create space for it, however that looks in our lives, whether it's time just for our partner, whether it's date nights or, you know, traveling just with them, whether it's, you know, there's lots of creative ways to make that happen, but the, the simple fact is we just can't let it be put on the back burner for everything else um, that's that's important. And that's really hard. I'm here to tell you it's not an easy ask, just like, you know, working out or, you know, being a great mom or being a great, you know, business person. Those all take a lot out of us, but it's all about how we prioritize our time. Um, and we just can't let that one get get ignored, in my opinion. I totally agree. Um, my biggest advice would be to put it on the list. Um, and I actually, I have a good friend who, um, I always say that I, I get approached at like the most random places, like in, at a shul kiddish, somebody will come up to me and they'll be like, I have to talk to you about this. Um, and this actually happened where somebody said, you know, like I put having sex with my husband on my to-do list and I feel so guilty about that. And I was like, why do you feel guilty? Like, why, why is that? So, like you put things that you prioritize on the list. And she was like, but I put it next to like 
going to the grocery store. And I was like, but you're still prioritizing it because it's on the list. You know, we put things on our list that we have to prioritize. You have to go for a mammogram, you put it on your list. You, you wanna make time and have intention. Um, and then another piece of framework that I give when I do teach Kalas is that we spend a lot of time focusing on what's not allowed during the time of Nida, um, during the, uh, the time from when a woman's period starts until she goes to the mikvah, immerses in a ritual bath, um, to remind us that like sexual contact is not permitted during that time. Like we put a, a special vase on the table to remind us that we're not supposed to pass things to each other. And we rearrange the furniture in our bedrooms and we change the clothes that we're wearing. And like we drastically change our activities and our behavior during that time. Why don't we do the same with like a mental and behavioral shift during the time when we are allowed to have sexual contact with our spouses? Like why can't we apply the same kind of tenets of mindfulness to the time when we are allowed to have sex and we are allowed to have physical contact to the time that we can't. Um, and so I think that having that kind of, you know, we spend a lot of time intentionally withholding during the time of Nida. And if we can also have the same intention during the time of Tahara, I think that that is a framework that fits really well within our lifestyle and helps to make the concept more accessible. Definitely. Um, now, what if, um, for those that were Shomer Nagir, did not touch prior to marriage, how do you know if you're sexually compatible if you've never touched? So maybe we can start with Carly. Yeah, what a great question. Um, I think that um, there are signals that there's going to be sexual compatibility. Like there's the butterflies fluttering in your stomach or there's like what we think of as chemistry. Um, but there are also plenty of people who have had sexual contact prior to marriage um, outside of our community that like still decide to get married even though it wasn't great in the beginning. And so I would say that like everybody has a learning curve and as long as you have positive communication, there's no reason that that initial sexual experience is gonna define every sexual experience that you have together as a couple. Um, and so I would say, not that it's irrelevant, because I think that it's really important that there is a basis for chemistry and there is a basis for feeling like you could be that vulnerable and intimate with somebody um, and having the desire to, like if you really want to rip their clothes off, then I would say that's a really good sign. Um, if being Shomer Nagia is really hard, that's a really good sign. Um, but I would say in terms of like sexual compatibility, that that stuff can be learned. And as long as you have the safety and the intimacy and the emotional connection, um, then, then you're going to, you're going to end up in a place that's good. I love that Carly. And as a non-Orthodox woman, I would say that I think that it was really, um, you know, the, the example you gave about people who are not Orthodox, I think it's really important. And I think also it's important to know that sexual compatibility or maybe, you know, the way that you interact with your partner sexually changes over your life, right? It's never, it never stops changing. So maybe you have sexual compatibility at the beginning, but something will happen. For example, the pregnancy or the postpartum, you know, slide that you created, or maybe your partner has a medical problem. We're always as a, as a couple, as a partnership, renegotiating sexual compatibility. So really where you start, sometimes, like you said, it's great. And sometimes it's just a starting place um, for that negotiation process to begin. So. Thank you both so much for both of your comments. Um, now, just uh, veering off a little bit um, now, specifically talking about maybe patients that are people that are a bit older. How do you deal with libido and physical fragility or just aging in general? Um, we could just switch it off. You can start with Lindsay. Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite topics, like aging and sex. And it's because I want to think of myself as like a, you know, sexually active person when I'm when I'm aged. I'm going to say like 90. Um, but the point is, is that intimacy is important throughout our lives, right? But there's lots of different ways to experience emotional and physical intimacy. So when we talk about physical fragility, that can mean a lot of things. That can mean chronic pain due to arthritis. That can mean, um, you know, sexual dysfunction due to medical problems like erectile dysfunction is really common. Um, you know, we've got lots, maybe a person that's had a cancer diagnosis and that's resulted in some sexual difficulties. There's lots of different things that could be related to that. 
And I think that what it comes down to is number one, always advocating for ourselves, right? So if you are in a medical relationship where you're not feeling comfortable talking about sex or you're not getting the attention that you need when it comes to sexual problems, you need to figure that out, right? We need to get to someone who feels comfortable talking about that. We need to get to someone um, who knows, who is knowledgeable about those topics. Um, and then we we can expand our intimacy menu, right? It doesn't have to be all about, all about penetrative sex. If that's painful for you or your partner, <clears throat> If you have a male partner <clears throat> is unable to maintain an erection, there's other ways to experience sexual intimacy. Um, and so I would really, and there are also sexual aids, like there's um, like this, it looks like a gymnastics mat, but you can put it, it's like called a little pillow, right? That you can put underneath you to help aid if you have trouble with mobility or if you're having trouble with pain. So there's lots of ways that um, like fragile bodies, differently abled bodies can navigate emotion, uh, emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy. And what it requires, once again, theme of the webinar is communication um, and also being open to these, you know, non-scripted ways of experiencing intimacy as well. Um, I would I would absolutely agree with that. And I would say that even AIDS that you might have thought like would, would be in the category like I'll never need something like that. Like um, when when uh, post menopause, for example, sometimes women need a lot stronger stimulation in order to be able to achieve an orgasm and a vibrator is the only way that that can happen. And so, um, you know, if if you are willing to go outside of your comfort zone, I can promise you that there's like a whole world of pleasure that's out there, um, but it will require you going a little bit out of your comfort zone in order to get there. Definitely. Um, well, thank you for that. I'm sure that's like incredibly helpful either for people currently or like in the future to just think about and understand and know for themselves. Um, I'm sure that you also get this question often, but can you speak about um, the length of time it takes for a woman to orgasm versus a man to orgasm um, and like how that can affect the relationship? So Carly, if you want to start us off. So I really hesitate to define again, like what's normal. Um, average for women to achieve orgasm is somewhere around 14 or 15 minutes of clitoral stimulation. Um, for a lot of women, it could be a lot longer. Um, some women can achieve clitoral stimulation from like one or two minutes or even less. Um, so I think that this affects when when this comes into play as far as how it affects a relationship is when there's feelings of like either not being good enough or performance anxiety that come into place from either um, the person who is trying to have an orgasm or the person who's trying to help their spouse have the orgasm. Um, and so being able to, again, communicate about that and create that context where um, you know, like, like we said earlier, taking orgasm as the focus off the table um, and focusing instead on pleasure and what feels good um, can help to create that context. Um, men achieve orgasm in a much faster, um, statistically for most men, it's somewhere between like five or six minutes of thrusting. Um, something like um, premature ejaculation is defined as somebody who has a, who ejaculates in less than one minute of penetrative sex, where average for men is somewhere between five or six minutes. So the recommendation, and I would say like the most prescribed um, form of sex that is recommended in sex therapy to help to fill that gap and make sure that both people experience enhanced pleasure is to focus on the female orgasm first and then to focus on the male orgasm after. Totally agree. I don't really have much to add, but um, totally agree with everything Carly said. Alrighty. Um, now just moving on to like the pregnancy aspect that we, we touched on previously um, and postpartum as well, but do you have any tips on increasing desire for intimacy during pregnancy and breastfeeding when um, people feel like they have less desire? And then also just going around, like with regards to that also, what would you say is the normal amount of time to have a lower libido after giving birth? Um, we can start with Dr. Harper and then move on to Carly. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's tough. You know, it, when you're in a very specific part of life, like pregnancy and postpartum, 
um, you know, really our guidance is to listen to your body. You don't want to like make yourself have sex if you if you're not feeling well or if you're in pain or something like that. Now, if you're truly if you're feeling physically up to it and you're just not mentally there, then and your goal is to Im- increase the amount of you know times that you're that you are feeling intimate or wanting to be intimate. You know, I would really tap into that arousal desire pathway, which is to say, okay, is there a context in which you do experience that desire? Could it be could it involve um you know your partner um you know interacting with you in a specific way could it involve erotica could it involve anything like that and that way you can kind of get that pathway kicked off um but you know it's we're careful because we don't want to like push women into having sex more often than they want to okay so that's important um postpartum there's so much going on, right? With breastfeeding, with your body healing, and and to the someone's point, they put in the Q and A that some women feel like having sex before six weeks, and that's absolutely true. I can say as an OBGYN, um, but I would say that's not the common experience, um, and it just involves a lot of renegotiating in terms of um, who is going to be doing the new childcare duties. How how are you feeling in your body with your breast and with your vulva and vagina? And so that's that's a different answer for every woman but i would say that if you if that's something that's important in your relationship it's something that you want to prioritize that you try to see you know how can you gently introduce it back into your relationship um and it's kind of like exercise right if we haven't exercised for many years we're sitting on the couch thinking why would we ever exercise that sounds really awful when i could just get an extra you know hour of sleep but then when you go to the gym or whenever you you know take a walk and you feel so much better afterwards and you think oh man I should do this more often. Sex is really the same, right? So whenever we engage in sex and it's a positive experience for us physically and emotionally, it really um, positively impacts how often we want to have sex. So postpartum, even though you're kind of like, oh, I never ever want to do that again, sometimes a little bit of that introduction back into our lives can really help us to frame it in a more positive way sooner. So I would say don't, you know, as long as you're as long as you're feeling up to it, don't don't neglect the area um, if you're if you're feeling interested. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that you said. Um, One piece that I know was really helpful for me when I went through this transition, when I was doing fertility treatment and then had my children, um, was realizing that sexuality and feeling like I could access sexuality actually had less to do with being able to view my husband as a sexual person and had much more to being able to view myself as a sexual person. So figuring out what helps you see yourself as someone who is capable of being sexual will make it easier and and more accessible for you to prioritize that in your relationship. Um, And so that takes a lot of self-awareness and sometimes there is a need for support there and that's okay. It takes negotiation. Humor really helps. Like how many times have we had to, you know, put things on pause to go and take care of a breastfeeding baby? You know, it's kind of like a universal experience. Highly recommend that you get more than one sound machine, one for inside of your room and one for inside of your children's room. Because if you put it outside of your room, your kids will all congregate outside of your room to be like, what is this? I want to play with all the buttons. Um, But it's so that you can kind of drown out everything else and focus only on you and your and your spouse. Oh, that's that's really important um, to recognize that like you have needs, you have wants as well. Um, now we we discussed or we touched on erotica in general. I think this is a specific question for um, you, Carly. But how do you benefit? Uh, how do you balance the benefit of reading erotica and romance for your sexual desires with Shmirat Nayam? And also, if you can kind of explain that, I know a lot of people have questions, but would never feel comfortable talking to their rabbi about this. Yeah, I saw this question come up in the chat and I'm really glad that you asked it live. Um, I So my understanding of the halacha is that if what you are doing in order to get in the mood or a sexual activity in general is consensual between you and your spouse, pleasurable for both of you, or you're participating in it in order to increase intimacy and closeness in your relationship, then it's 100% permitted. Um, The area where that gets a little bit cloudy is um, if you're fantasizing about another person. And so 
I would say to focus on, you know, erotica or focus on romantic themes, romantic novels that aren't going to lead you to like be fantasizing about specific actors or specific characters, um, but instead are helping to provide that context for you to feel aroused. Um, Shmirade Nayim is guarding your, our eyes. So we want to try to avoid any material that would be considered not sneeze or modest. Um, and I think that in this sense, the same way, like we, we wear lingerie, you know, we, you know, my college teacher said to me that there's no room for sneeze in the bedroom. So if you're using the erotica to help increase desire and intimacy and arousal in your bedroom, then I can't see a reason why it wouldn't be permitted as long as you're doing it within the framework of building closeness and intimacy with your spouse. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sure we all appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I definitely do. Um, so now just moving on to a question for both of you, we can start with Dr. Harper, but um, can you maybe speak to the, the fact that sometimes your attraction to your spouse waxes and wanes and how do you kind of deal with that as a couple or individually on your own? Yeah, I think that's totally normal. And if you're planning on spending, you know, your entire adult life with someone like I think having realistic expectations is a is a big part of that. So I think knowing that that's normal and not panicking and thinking something is terribly wrong, I think is a huge part of the equation. And then I think that, um, you know, really focusing on opportunities kind of like Carly said before, like the context of things like focusing on when when does your partner do something that really excites you and putting a sexual context around that it doesn't have to be that you're physically necessarily, you know, super sexually attracted to your partner. But maybe they have a way of interacting with the world or maybe they have a way of, you know, interacting with your children or you know there's there's opportunities that we can keep an eye out for in our life that can um, reconnect us sexually with our partner. And it's all about frame of mind. You know, there's there's the experience of like when someone's on your nerves, everything they do like gets on your nerves, right? But we can flip that on its head too. It's like, this is my life partner. You know, I, I am excited to have a fulfilling sexual relationship with him. What does he do that feeds into that idea? And it doesn't necessarily have to be something physical. Um, so I think paying attention to those things and, you know, really emphasizing those in our own brains is where, where it's at whenever you're kind of in one of those um, waning moments. But I'd love to hear what Carly has to say. I think that um, I was actually having a conversation with a client this morning about this idea um, because I think that it's it's so it's so real that like our partners have things about them that like sometimes we're really attracted to and sometimes there are things about our partners that we're really not attracted to and some of the work of being in a relationship is being able to put the focus on and like spotlight those aspects that we are really attracted to um and there's actually there's a great visual if you can picture like a triangle um, there's a psychologist, uh, Sternberg, who talks about like the triangle of a relationship and he talks about it in terms of passion and commitment and intimacy. And based on where you are in that like attraction cycle, you might be in passion, which is that like, I want to rip your clothes off stage of, of your relationship and where like, you can't get enough of each other. And then your commitment stage might be that stage where you're like, wow, I really feel like your roommate and I'm not really so attracted to you, but like, I like you. And I think that, you know, I'm happy that I'm married to you, but like, there's no passion in this. And I think going back to the last question, this is where a lot of people find themselves when there are new babies being born. Um, because the idea of prioritizing that passion just feels inaccessible. Um, and then the third tenet, which is intimacy, is like the marriage of the two, of being able to say to your spouse, like I said before, like I really cannot put it, put it all out there for a four course meal, but like let's, let's make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, and so I think that um, being able to remind yourself like what initially attracted yourself to your spouse and then being able to spotlight those aspects that you are attracted to um, and then giving yourself permission to be like, you know, it's really hard to be married to someone who doesn't pick up their socks every day and, and that's okay. And it doesn't mean that you regret being married to them. You wouldn't change it, but like naming it as a fact and giving yourself permission to have all the complicated feelings can sometimes make it easier to bridge that gap. 
Definitely. And I don't think I'm going to be able to look at um, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich quite the same again. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, that is all. Those are all the questions that we will have um, answered live. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lindsay Harper and Har Carly Hadash, um, for all the information that you shared, for really everything, for showing up, for being here, for answering all of these questions. Um, we will be sure to be sending out a link to the um, YouTube, to the recording within the week. Um, just thank you so much to um, Joma's Women's Health Committee, to Dr. Moses, um, to Dr. Leiter and Dr. Weinstein for answering questions in the Q&A as well. And um, for the entire women's health team, Tamar, um, Michal, Miriam, really everyone for making this all a possibility if the um, hosts can just